What we come to now is the book of Jude. And, uh, you know, I, I made jokes about that. I said, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if I've ever read the book of Jude in, in all of my life of studying the Word. Because Jude is one of those books. How many of you can uh, quote some scripture out of Jude? Yeah, that's what I thought. I was, <laughs> I, I was like, okay, Lord, it's one chapter. The book of Jude, and, and you know, I was like, are you, sure? are you sure that's not an apocryphal book? I mean, is that really in the... I'm just kidding. That's where we're going tonight. What I found in my study, as I always put in the time and I search out the word, and let me tell you, when you're speaking out of a book, that's not one of the most common. It is a short book. But I begin to realize that there is a lot in this book, and it is such a powerful word for us in the very season we're in right now. The book of Jude very um, mysteriously comes right before Revelation, and I think there's a definite reason for that. Just like we're in the last days now, the book of Jude is the setup for the last days. It's, it's talking about some of the things that we might face, and I'm going to start out tonight. Let's just go through Jude 1, 3 through 7. Jude some scholars say was the brother of Jesus. And it can be disputed. There's some that believe other. I don't have any clear counsel on it. But what I do know is that there is a possibility that who we're even hearing from, it is the brother of James, the brother of Jesus. He says, Jude chapter 1, verse 3. Follow along with me on the screens, if you will. Are you all going to put it up back there for me? <clears throat> he says, dear friends, Although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Now, let me stop right there a minute. He says a lot in this. He, he, says, he says, listen, he goes, I, I, was, I was all excited I was about to start writing some stuff that was just on my mind and talk about our salvation. You know, we like to talk about being saved a lot in the church, you know. You know but, he, but something stopped him dead in his tracks. And we know that the Word of God, the Bible teaches us, is it's inspired. It's anointed by the Holy Spirit. Men's pens moved in inspiration of a spirit behind the pen. And he is stopped in his tracks, and he says, as I was about to write to you about this subject, I felt a compulsion, a, a compulsion, a, something drew me and said, no, you've got to talk about this. Fight for the faith. The book of Jude, the theme that runs through the whole book is that, listen, there is a battle going on. There is a war there's spiritual, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Man, we need to hear that scripture every day, ten times a day. Because the enemy is so skillful at setting us up to look at flesh, look at brothers, look at sisters, look at gas pumps being empty, look at situations in the economy, look at the polit political landscape of the United States. And, and listen, we, we get these things. The enemy's always devising strategy to pull our attention off of the spirit behind the thing and to look at each other or to look in fear at a situation. You and I are not, we're not victims tonight. It, it would have been enough if he said we're conquerors, but he said we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We cannot be victims and be victors. We are either what God says we are or we're not. And he says we are, he says, I'll make you to be the head and not the tail. He, said, he didn't say you are going to do it. He says, I will make you to be above only and not beneath. Man, we've got promises tonight, y'all. Jude is, is referring to some things. He, he's calling us into attention to say, listen, wake up. There's going to come a falling away in the last days. 
There's going to come a deception. There's going to come a, a cooling of the spirit. Listen, the generation before the, us in this room, this, this teen generation and the children's generation, I'm going to tell you right now, it scares me in the flesh. I have to get back in the spirit, right? It scares me to see in the flesh when I look at it and see what's happening spiritually in that group. If you don't realize that the enemy has sunk his teeth in in these days more than I've ever seen in my life, we've got to open our eyes. But as bleak and dark as it can look, we have to remember another time when things looked bleak and dark. And that's, you know, we, let's go back to Genesis 1-1 for a second. Just remember that, that God, the Bible says in the beginning God created heaven and the earth and it was without form and, and it was void and, and it was this darkness and the spirit of God began to move upon the face of that deep darkness and, and things begin to happen, man. Light began to shine in darkness and, and we serve that same God. He's got that, that same creative power today. And so no matter what it might look like on the surface, we serve a God that can shatter the darkness with his light. And he he's, he's wants to use you and I to be a part of that. Wants to use you and I. Fight for the faith. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Christ as Lord and Savior. When I read that, I immediately thought human beings. But I began to remember that you know what I really feel? It, he uses the word people. That's the way the translation says it. But I began to realize that there's no way it can be people. Because that would completely contradict the scripture I just said that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. My friends, there is a spiritual strategy that has slipped in among us. This spiritual strategy, its assignment is to make us feel comfortable under a banner of grace that says there is no punishment for sin and consequences anymore. So many of us today, I'm telling you, hear me, so many of us live in the comfort and confidence of feeling like no matter what we do, grace is going to erase that somehow, no matter what, what, what flesh we indulge in, no matter what passions we pursue, that somehow there's just no consequence for that. But there's a word that says, be not deceived. There's a reason the word deception was used, because it is a deceiving spirit. God will not be mocked. For whatsoever people sow, that shall they also reap. Whatever seed you're planting, man, that is what harvest you're going to be eating off of. We've been planting these things for too long thinking, God's going to cover us. God's going to forgive me. Listen, God is all, there's another side, okay? There's, there's, a, there's a balance of scales. Over here, there, there is, your sin is covered. I, I don't want you to hear me wrong tonight. I'm not preaching a message that, that removes grace. What I'm doing is I'm highlighting the other side of the scale tonight. Over here, yes, the way that we don't know where God's mercy ends and begins. You pile that thing up, Jesus covered it in the blood of Jesus, and I thank God for that. But somewhere over here, Jude is trying to remind us that, wait, there's some things you need to know. Let's see what he says. Though you already know all of this, he's assuming a lot of these things we know. But I hadn't read the book of Jude much, many times. Though you already know all of this, I want to remind you that the Lord at one time delivered his people out of Egypt. Man, what a miraculous delivery. I mean, I'm talking about God. He could have taken them and snatched them right out. And, but, you know, he went this real extravagant route, didn't he? I mean, he wanted to put himself on display. Sometimes God lets you and I go through some junk because he wants to show off, and he wants you to be a trophy of what he can do. And just like the Israelites, he pulled them out of Egypt, and he brought the plagues, and he, and he showed his authority. And instead of taking them 11 days around the journey like it could have been, he let them go all the way for 40 years. But what it says is it reminds us of something, that, that yes, in his mercy, he did what he said. He fulfilled his promise. He pulled them out. He delivered them from bondage. But here's what else he did. But later he destroyed those who did not believe. Let me say it this way. 
those who lost the fight for their faith, he destroyed them. We got to somehow wrestle with this. Wait a minute, God, the God of grace? He, this is in the New Covenant, by the way, right? We, we flipped through the New Testament to get to this, didn't we? I mean, we need to think about this a minute. The God of grace who pulled them out of Egypt, delivered them with his mighty hand, but because they lost the battle. Man, I know it's going to be quiet in here tonight, and that's okay. I'm not that kind of preacher that wants you shouting all the time. Sometimes I want to feel you piercing me because I know that you're locked in and listening. Tonight it might be a heavy word, but you know what? That's what Jude brought. It ain't my fault. I just got dealt the book. And I'm just handing it out, okay? He delivered the people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their proper dwelling, these he has kept in darkness. Listen, this is talking about celestial beings. They live face to face with God, and they did not keep their proper position. He created them for his, for his service, and yet somehow they find themselves cast into outer darkness. How much more do you and I feel? The Bible says we're a little lower than the angels. It uses that quote somewhere. But I want you to see something. It doesn't mean our value is less. Obviously, we know that now. But what we need to know is this, is that if he did these things with them, what makes us feel like we can just go act any old way we want, do anything we want to do, conduct ourselves. Listen, we're going to talk about a few examples Jude gives us, and we're going to break it down as the strategy of the enemy. We're trying to open up the light on it tonight and shine that light and expose the darkness that hides the strategy and plans of the enemy. Mm. Jude 1 talks to us about these demonic influences. Let's go to verse 1 and 11. I mean, chapter 1, verse 11. Jude says, Woe to them that have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error and have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. And I'm sure each and every one of you can explain Korah's rebellion, right? No? Uh, what about Balaam's error? You know how to talk about you know, Listen, I don't feel bad, okay? Because when I started digging into this, I was like, wow, Lord, I've been missing some things. Because this, I needed to know this. I needed to understand this. We're going to talk first. Let's go to, let's go to uh, Genesis. We're going to look at, I'm going to break these three down. Verse 11, woe to them that have taken the way of Cain. Let's start with the way of Cain. Y'all, I got to tease you for a minute here. Look at this. This is my, um, this is the most beautiful Bible I've ever preached from. I want to tell you, this is that thing they give you, Pastor Lisa called it, is if you get that little plastic bag the first time visitors get, and you reach in there, you're like, there's this book in there. This is the book that you pull out of there, you know, and it's in larger print, you know. You know, you, you know you're an, a, a first-time Bible reader if you got the larger print version. Um, but isn't it funny, man, the anointing can flow out of anything, can it? The Word of God can just be on old parchment paper crumpled up in some cave somewhere and come out and just light up the world, can't it? <clears throat> but y'all forgive me as I'm trying to flip through. See, I'm used to my iPhone, you know, and I can just touch a button and hit some screen. But I'm trying to, I'm trying to be a little old school with y'all tonight, okay? <clears throat> Let's go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Now, Adam, this is talking about, this is, the, the, the part we're dealing with now is what Jude said. And he said, they, they have taken the way of Cain, the way of Cain. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. Now, side note here, that's, like a, that's a real mouthful, but let, let's just break that down a second. This is a complete rabbit trail, but i got to chase it a minute because it's a good one. I want you to think about, they had just been told by God in the previous chapters that they had sinned, they'd ate the fruit, and that surely they would die. Now, here's Adam and Eve. They're just going about their time in the garden. They're like, okay, well, these, this, this stuff we're doing here, this is not too bad after all. This kind of seems like, this, this is new, but hey. And then all of a sudden, Eve is, she gets real mean. She's starting to get grumpy, and Adam's like, what, what happened here? This must be part of the curse. I remember God talking about this, and, and all of a sudden, she's starting to swell, and, and she's not interested anymore, Adam. You know, like she, she's like, stay away from, keep your six-foot distance. And then, 
All of a sudden, she's having these horrible pains, and she starts throwing up all the time. Adam's convinced Eve is dying. She's going to leave before me. This is what God talked about. She's the one that gave me the fruit. It must be that she's going to die first. And he sees, oh, my gosh. It's like now all of a sudden it's like, what is happening? There's this movement going on and the swelling that Eve has, and, and they're freaking out. Then finally the day comes. Eve's convinced now. Adam was not crazy. She's dying. This is pain like I've never felt before. There's blood. There's water. And she's laying there in the most excruciating moment of her life thinking, I guess this is the price I had to pay. And all of a sudden, in the deepest despair, the silence of the gardens pierced with a baby cry. They had never seen birth before. They didn't know what this was. There had never been a child born. This Cain was the very first. Sometimes what feels like your darkest night, when it feels like the end and you're just certain that you're going to come to an end, you're just giving birth to something new. Something new is coming. Your baby is going to start crying. It's going to pierce the darkness, and it will make you forget all the pain, the joy of the child until they grow up. Amen? So that's where we come to here. This firstborn baby. Eve and Adam have enjoyed him, man. Eve even had a promise that said, one day your seed will crush that serpent. So she might be thinking, Cain, he's the deliverer, man. He's such a great young man. He's wonderful. And she has Abel. But Abel is a little easier pregnancy. The second one's always better, right? Maybe. Some people say yes. Some people say no. Abel just was a a better child. He's the younger one, you know. Sometimes, sometimes the younger one just behaves better. You know, you, you, you certainly she wasn't scared anymore. She knew what this was. Oh, okay, we got this, Adam. This, now we're going to enjoy this pregnancy. Cain comes along. And it tells us here in the scripture, it said that, uh, she said, with the help of the Lord, I've brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. Remember, we're trying to find out what Jude was telling us was the way of Cain. I like to kind of get ADD a little bit and, and just flow around here. So y'all just enjoy it with me, will you? I'll try to make sure it's profitable along the way, you know. Now, Abel kept flocks and Cain kept the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits. Now, notice the wording here. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. It kind of makes it sound like he just kind of gathered up some fruits here and there, and, and he was like, okay, I'm a, some of this stuff I plan, I'm going to take this to the Lord as an offering. But Abel also brought an offering. Notice this language. It says, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flocks. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Now, I want you to just think about this a minute. How interesting. It took a while for me to really dig into this, to figure out what was it that Cain actually did. I mean, we read the story, know that when he killed Abel, you know, we know he killed Abel, so it's like, well, easily he did something wrong. But what did he do before that? You know, you and I need to know this because we're, we're in this world too. We, we're, we're following God and we're, we're bringing our gifts to him and we're giving him our service. What is it that was the difference? The difference is that God wants your firsts. Whatever you give God the first part of, he will bless the whole remaining portion. It is the law of first fruits. This is not me teaching a message on tithing tonight. This is me teaching you a message on bringing God your best. It means putting him first in your life. It means making sure that no matter what you do, that you don't ever allow yourself to just casually come in and offer up a praise and worship to God. It means that you come in and you have a mindset that says, I'm going to pierce the heavenlies. God, tonight I'm giving you my best. I'm giving you my first. You get first fruits. I'm not going to worry about a gas shortage. I'm not going to worry about what my 401k is doing or what even my kid is doing right now. What I'm going to worry about only is that I please you and that I bring you the first. We've got to put God first in everything. 
This was a distinguishing factor between him and Cain. And this is what happened. Is, okay, okay, I'm, I'm going to break this down. Spiritually, this is what was happening. God says, it says, then Cain was very angry. And I just thought this phrase was interesting. His, his face was downcast. Did you notice that? His face was downcast. Whenever demonic spirits have strategized against you and you have allowed that thing to talk to you. It, 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 they, listen, this is how it works. It shows up on your face. You can see somebody when they are broken. Have you ever met somebody that's just in absolute despair? Man, it, your, your heart breaks to look at them in the face because you see the weight pull down on them. Well, this is what God saw. He said, he sees this, and he explains to Cain, I wish Cain would have listened. Because he tries to give Cain a warning, just like he tries to warn you and I. The Lord said to Cain, Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face so downcast? He says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? And sometimes it's as easy as us just doing what is right. What was right in this case? Giving God the first position of our life. Putting him first in everything. That's what was right. He says, don't you know you'll be accepted? But then he says this. He says, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you, but you must rule over it. This is what God was saying. He was saying, Cain, he says, you can't see what I see. Because when, you're, when your forefathers, when, you, when Adam and Eve fell, you were separated out of that dimension. You, weren't over, you were no longer able to see into the spirit realm. The time was that, see, God can operate in all the realms. So he was able to talk to Cain. But Cain could not see that there was a door of his heart. It was, the, it was, this, it was this demon that was hiding and waiting. And it, gives, it paints the picture that it was a setup, that this demon was talking to Cain. And he was saying, can you believe this is how it works today. I want you to hear this language. Can you believe? They didn't say anything to you. I don't even think they care about you. They don't know who you are. They don't know what your talent is. They don't know what you can do. They don't know this. They don't know that. Man, he's constantly whispering in your ear. He's whispering, saying, you're overlooked. You're defeated. You know who you are. You're a, you're a former porn addict. You're this. You're that. You're a drug addict. You're an alcoholic. You're the, he's labeling you, and he's trying his best. And he's always there trying to get you to come into agreement with him. And Cain, he's there in his ear saying, you were rejected by God. God doesn't care about you. He loves your brother more than you. Look at what he did for Abel. And all God's saying is, Cain, this is a test. You can pass it. You can pass it. All you have to do is silence the voice of that thing. Let the Holy Spirit light up your face. Close the door of your heart on that thing that's hiding. It's waiting to trap you. One more step and you are done. That's what we talked about in the prayer. Tonight, he highlights and lights up with his word. He tried to give Cain the light, but light, Cain's eyes was closed. He could not open his eyes and see the truth. And you know the story as it goes that he eventually killed his brother. All because he allowed this thing. This, listen, it wasn't just his human emotion. It was a, a strategy. And this is what Jude is trying to warn us about, that this is how the enemy works. You've got to fight for your faith because you are facing an enemy that does not play fair. He uses your weaknesses and your insecurities, and he tries to make you feel like you've got to do it in your own strength. And he, and he tries to make you feel like time's running out. And like, man, you're just, God's rejected you. This person has that. They get that. You got nothing. So what are you going to do with it? And the face begins to change. I see it in church all the time. Churches, this church, every, I mean, listen, we're not, none of us are immune to this. I've dealt with it myself. I've had to conquer these demons too. I know what it feels like to want to be bitter and angry at somebody. I know the temptation 
to listen to that voice that says, oh, listen, look at them. you got to learn to take captive every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The moment that dart hits your mind, that fiery dart that the enemy has shot into your head, you need to immediately take captive that thing before it begins to reflect on your face. Because once it's sunk, it's claws into you. It begins to control your emotions and it controls your thoughts. And if you let your emotions be taken over, then you just kind of have to burn down to the ground and start over again. Unless you have a window of opportunity where your eyes open for a moment, God gives us grace. Sometimes that window will open, and if you'll come and fall out of agreement with that thing, and you'll repent right then, you'll say, God, forgive me. Those were wrong thoughts. I should have never let that thing plant in me. Don't I know I can trust you, God? Because it all boils down to that. It all boils down to us saying, God, I can't trust you. I can't trust you to fulfill what you said you would. I can't trust you to protect me from others hurting me. I can't trust you that you're going to order my steps into a good place. I don't trust you, God. And this spirit is right there to say, yes, you're right. He's just going to lead you right into the slaughter. But I'm going to tell you something. There may come a time in your life that you have to follow Jesus right through a fire. And it's in that fire, Jesus, hmm, it is in that fire that the ropes that have tightly bound you, that's where they're burned off. Sometimes you might have to walk through some difficult seasons with God because otherwise you could not have deliverance. But my friends, very listen, Jesus said, narrow is the way. Few there are that find it. We need to wake up. Fight for your faith. It's a narrow road. It ain't easy. Few there are in the room, not out there in the world. Few there are that will find. Man, I'm telling you, I have seen so many people. Now, eventually, people go through this, and they get recycled. You know, they walk their lap in the wilderness. Some of you are in this church right now and you've come from other places and you might have gone through exactly what I'm talking about. What you might have gone through was the whole process of the enemy, how he pulled you out. And so you found another church and you came and you planted here. That same thing is going to happen again and again until you learn to overcome that thing. You will not be just instantly. God won't say, okay, you get a pass. No, he says, you're going to have to face this thing until you overcome it. Many of us, are in this building now because we have been recycled. Now, that's not everybody, but there are some, and you got to wake up because it is an end-time word tonight. We have to make sure that we listen to what Judas is a warning. Fight for your faith. Let's go back to Jude. Jude talks about, I'm going to see if I can turn this old ugly Bible here. Hang on. Lord, Thank you for using ugly things. I'm glad. I'm glad for that. I'm glad for that. <laughs> yeah, see, somebody gets that, right? <laughs> he goes into talking next about Balaam's error. The next thing he talks about is the way of Cain, and he goes into Balaam's error. Let me tell you what Balaam's error was. Balaam was a prophet. How are we doing on time? I don't have a clock up here anymore. What? Five after. Okay, we're, going, we're, we're close, guys. Balaam was a prophet, anointed by God. Listen, he had great gifts. I mean, the Bible says that when he would speak over somebody blessings, they were blessed. And when, they would, when he would speak a curse, that they were cursed. And he would come and he'd bring a word from God, and it was right on spot. But what Balaam made the error of doing is different from Cain. See, Cain, that's one aspect of how the enemy pulls us away. But another way is that he'll try his best to to divide you off and to be disobedient, chasing after your own fleshly desires. See, Balaam ended up for profit, hired by a king to speak curse over Israel. And we know the story, some of you know the story, you know, the Balaam's donkey, you know, where the donkey refused, and he finally talks to him, and he says, listen, you're trying to beat on me to get me to go somewhere, but I'm trying to save your life. God was standing there, Jesus, the Bible says the angel of the Lord, was standing there with a sword drawn. And he turns away, the donkey turns away, spares Balaam's life. But still we're warned by Jude not to fall into Balaam's error. It said because of his greed, 
Many of us, we have this greed in us. And if the enemy can't get you with a cane type way, then he'll come at you with this way where he wants to draw you and, and pull your passions off of the things of God and set them on other things like materialism. Man, one of the best things that can happen is for God to bless your job and your business and you begin to flourish. But if you're not careful, don't think for a second that the enemy won't try to make that a God unto you with a lowercase g. I know that feeling. When success begins to take hold, especially if you're like me, where you'd lost everything. Man, I mean, I know what it feels like. I know what it feels like to be 40 years old and go work at McDonald's because you just don't know what else to do. Y'all have heard that story, some of y'all. Lost it all, man, the house, the cars, humiliated, embarrassed. So when you finally start getting success, man, you're like, thank you, Jesus. And that feeling of being on the mountaintop is just wonderful, and it it consumes you. But there comes that moment where you've got to make some choices. Will I allow this mountaintop to become my idol? Am I going to just stay here? What if God calls me to the valley for a minute? Because he's got another mountain for me to climb. Well, I'm going to tell you, we've got to be wise and discerning. Don't fall into Balaam's error. Consumed with your passions for other things. It's not just money. It can be anything. It can be a relationship that God is not honoring. It can be lust. It can be anything that pulls your attention away from God. Balaam's error. And then he talks about the rebellion of Korah. The rebellion of Korah. See, let let me just, this is the final one I'm going to talk about. Y'all getting something out of this tonight? Okay. I'm just teaching tonight. We're home folk, right? So it says, Korah, son of Azar. This is in Numbers chapter 16, verse 1. Korah, son of Azar, the son of Korath, the son of Levi, and certain Reubenites, Dathan and Abram, sons of Eliab, and own son of Peleth, come became insolent. You know that happens a lot of times in groups. People just become insolent. They, they, but that's not again. That's not a human trait. That's not an emotion that just came up out of nowhere. Insolence is division. It's it's actually stubbornness. The Bible says stubbornness is as the sin of witchcraft. See, when you get into a divisive spirit. You open, you need to hear this. When you get stubborn, you turn yourself over to demonic spirits. You are in a sorcery type relationship. You might as well be sitting at a Ouija board or or talking to a tarot card reader. You're, You're opening yourself up when you get into a spirit of stubbornness that just refuses to hear truth. Or the people that God has surrounded you with When you decide to close them out, that is a spirit of stubbornness that has worked. That's what happens with pastors. Many times, pastors, they they preach the word, and the enemy says, man, this person's life is really changing. I can't, I don't have power to cause them to, you know, I can't just drag them off. What I have to do is deceive them to drag themselves off. That is where this insolent spirit begins to rise up it's demonic and it's a spirit of witchcraft and it it becomes and listen it works in groups it doesn't just stay with one person if it just stayed with one person it would have no power and it would just go away but what happens is it spreads like fire and it works and operates under the demon of gossip and it usually does its best work in darkness and secrecy What happens is is it tries to to broil underneath the surface. It tries to plant its roots and spread. And it it starts out with picking up the phone and calling your friends. See, let me tell you where these guys were right here. They had just come out of sending the ten spies into the promised land. They were right at the foothold, right at the threshold, ready to cross over to take the mountain. And they came back, and two of them, Joshua and Caleb, said, My God, it is amazing. This is the land flowing with milk and honey. And we need to go in at once and take hold of it. But ten of them, 
But 10 of them went in, but only, only eight of them came back and said, oh, we're just like grasshoppers to these guys. There's no way we can do it. We're defeated already before we begin. They will destroy us. Those giants in the land, man, I'm telling you, they were looking in the flesh. God is warning us. Don't look at things in your own strength. Don't do that. When God's calling you into your promised land, when he's given you a command and he expects you to move in and take hold, he is not waiting for you to sit back and think it all through and decide you can or cannot do it. This was the sin that destroyed them. This, this was a serious thing. They said, why don't we find ourselves a leader? Should, did we come out here just to die? Why didn't we stay back? They called Egypt the land flowing with milk and honey. Satan will so blind and deceive you that you'll think the very place you came from is the very place you want to go back to. But I'm going to tell you, friends, you've got to learn to shake off that way of Cain, the rebellion of, of, of Korah, and that era of Balaam. And you've got to open up your spiritual eyes and recognize that God, when he has brought you to a place, it's for a purpose and a season, and it is for a reason, and you have got to explore the fullness of that. Take captive those thoughts, those lies which exalt themselves. So that's where we find ourselves. It says, it rose up against Moses. With them were 250 Israelite men, and they were well-known community leaders who had been appointed members of the council. This is how it works. This spirit, it began working under the surface, and it collected up how many? 250 influential people, and those influencers were over groups of people. This thing began to really spread far and wide, and it is a cancer. Jude is warning us in these last times, do not rise up in rebellion against good authority, especially authority that God appointed. God planted Moses and put him over these people. And I can't tell you how, listen, this applies, I feel, in church today. It, reply, it applies in church. I, I have personally experienced, I, I had a church that I used to pastor, and, it, and it, it fell to a church split. And I'm telling you that it was one of the most painful experiences of my life. But that very thing is what prepared me to be a sword in the hand of my pastor. So, so I, I've been through that pain. So I've learned what it looks like. I've learned what the conversations sound like. I listened and I heard what my naysayers were saying. And I watched how even though I'd put a microphone in the hand of one and, and let the whole crowd sit there and listen to the accusations, and all of a sudden the thing would die. It had no power because people realized, this is all nothing. What are you talking about? But then as soon as those secret calls begin to happen again, as soon as the conversations happen in the dark corners, and, and hey, did, what do you, it always happens like this. Like, like, what do you think about this? Have you noticed this? I'm going to tell you, those are two of the most gut-wrenching phrases that can come out of your mouth. Because what you don't realize is just like Peter had his mouth hijacked by Satan, you are having your mouth hijacked by Satan too. Anytime that you speak against what God is doing, even if, and listen, your flesh will be deceived because you'll already feel like it's okay because you don't feel like God is doing it. But when you're in a place like this, there's too much at stake. God's never going to come to you to say the authority, that something's wrong with the authority. He's not going to do that. He's not going to come to me. He's going to deal with that person. And God knows, listen, God doesn't need our help. He knows how to do things. What we've got to do is submit to what God's put over us. All they had to do, you know what? They would have, they all were devoured. Let me tell you what happened to them. The Bible says that in the rebellion that God opened up the earth and it swallowed Korah and all those with him. This is what will happen to you and I. We will get sucked out of a move of God, of the very thing God's wanting to do, and we'll be devoured by the world. A worldly spirit will take hold You'll forget who God was in your life. You'll be so bitter. That thing will wrap you up so tightly that you will literally, I've watched this happen, guys. I know what it looks like when people who are so hurt, and you know what? They were just a casualty. They opened up to, they listened to the gossip, and you can't unhear some things. The enemy knows exactly how to pinpoint your weakness. And man, when that little fire hits your mind, it begins to burn out of control. 
you got to guard yourself of what you allow in. There's some things you cannot undo. Our brains work that way. You know, I think I've talked about this before, but some of you need to hear it again. We just need to be reminded is that our brain, God made it so that when we have something highlighted, if somebody shows you something, you're going to start looking for that and you're going to see it everywhere. You got to be careful what you let people say to you. Because all of a sudden, they gave you a new set of lenses, and you're going to start seeing things all over the place. You're like, I never saw this before. And you weren't intended to see it. Because guess what? Nobody's perfect. Nothing. Moses had flaws. He had challenges and issues. But he was who God anointed to bring them into the promised land. And they weren't going to get there any other way. That's how God works. You and I need to heed Jude's warning. He says these people in in verse 16 are grumblers and fault finders. Don't be that person, guys. The way of Cain, man, that enemy, he begins to subtly talk to you. And then he gets your passions shifted off into something else. And then he gets you offended and he starts the gossip train going and before too long, you lose passion for what he had for you. I've been in churches before. I'll never forget one of the most powerful moves of God I ever had in my life. I want to share this testimony because I was was a young man and I wasn't aware like I am now. But I was in one of the most biggest, most fastest growing churches that you could ever know. And under one of the greatest leaders, if I told you his name, everybody in the room would know who he is. Powerful ministry. And I taught college and career age Sunday school there. And I'll never forget that I had a friend that had brought me into that. He was actually the pastor on staff of the college careers, and they fired him. And I allowed that bitterness and unforgiveness to settle into my heart. And you know what's funny is that what I first noticed was, oh, my gosh, this pastor, he used to ring my bell every time he'd preach. I mean, I would think he was opening up my mail, and it was just always hitting home with me. And then as soon as I let this thing in, I noticed that the messages didn't stick to me anymore. It wasn't him, but I didn't know this at the time. And I thought, man, not only am I seeing this stuff going on, but he's not even anointed like he was. I mean, my God, I'm not getting anything out of these messages anymore. And it wasn't long before I left that church. And I went through the wilderness for a long time after that before finally God opened up some new things to me. But I had to go through the ringer all because I allowed myself to get, take in the bitterness and unforgiveness. And listen, what's funny is that nobody even whispered any gossip to me. It was my own sense of loyalty. I did not recognize that God was doing something. That guy went on to have a great career somewhere else, and, and it was God's plan for him. He had to probably go through his own thing. But I allowed it. Listen, you got to be on guard. The enemy doesn't play fair. There's going to be times that somebody hurts the feelings of somebody that you love and care about. And you're going to have to face that question. Am I going to allow this to get inside of me? Or am I just going to forgive and heal and move forward? I'm going to tell you what what, what Jude is telling us. Be aware. He's not telling us to be aware of people who gossip necessarily. He's saying be aware of the demon behind the gossip Because there is a spirit that has strategized a way, and its sole purpose is to destroy you and pull you away in these last days. And that, my friends, is the message in the book of Jude. If you will, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, God, Lord, I feel like I brought the word that you had for tonight. Some of it wasn't even what I'd planned, God. I think that some of it just became under your anointing. Lord, I know that the book of Jude goes on to say that we are to pray in the Holy Spirit to build ourselves up in your most holy faith. That's the answer. We've got to learn how to get before you on our face. Praying in the Spirit. Letting that, the Spirit, the Bible says that when we pray in the Spirit, The Spirit intercedes for us and prays about things in our deepest subconscious that we don't even know we need to pray for. It builds us up in our most holy faith. God, the word that came tonight is that we need to be on guard. That there is a a war going on. We've got to fight for the faith. 
God, help us not to be deceived tonight. I want to pray for those tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you'd say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I want to make sure that I don't listen to those voices. I want to make sure that I don't go the way of Cain. That I don't allow the materialism to take hold of my life like Balaam. And that I don't allow the rebellion of Korah to shift me off. It doesn't mean you're part of any rebellion or anything. It just means that you're saying tonight, I don't want to allow that spirit to have any part of me if it tries. If that's you, without anybody looking around, I want you to raise your hand high and unashamed right now. Hands all over the room. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, God, I thank you and I praise you, God. We have come together tonight. You've ordered our steps here for this moment. Your word never returns void. You promised that. You promised that your word would go forward and it would accomplish everything that it is supposed to do. And I declare right now in Jesus' name with that surgical knife that you begin to cut down deep into us, Lord. Release the stuff. Take out that cancer, God, that has been trying to set up in us in Jesus' name. Lord, I declare right now that the healing tonight that we're doing, God, is a healing from bitterness, a healing from anger and frustration, a healing from wounds, healing from jealousy and envy, strife. God, I thank you that tonight in Jesus' name that everyone here, Lord, God, that you would just let your sweet spirit rest upon us, Father. Hovering over us like a cloud, God. That you would lead us, Father. And you would open our eyes to see the deception. And that we would be aware of the schemes of the enemy, God. You said it is your word that opens up and becomes a shield to extinguish those fiery darts. And we stand right now and declare in Jesus' mighty name that it is done. Thank you, Father. Just thank him now for it. Ask him to cleanse your mind. Ask him to forgive you of any areas that you may not even be aware of where you've opened up yourself to these things. It's important. It's a last day warning. God, forgive us, Father. Cleanse our mind. Lord, if we've opened ourselves up to any of these things, God, that Jude warns about, help us, Father. Open our eyes and let your light shine in and expose our wrong, God. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.